Beginning on the project, you're going to need a movie clip on the stage. This movie clip that I have tonight, Bob, you can see it's Bob, is an animated movie clip, so he has his very active body shape while his eyes remain fixed, giving us this kind of appearance. Otherwise, there's nothing too fancy about Bob right now. That is step one, is to have an object that we will be able to move with the keyboard controls. So working with this, you have on the side of the screen, you will have code snippets. This is where there are basic actions that can do a variety of different things. They don't require you to have to know really any action script to make it work. Now a few things about controlling objects with code. When you want to control an object with code, to do so that object needs to have a instance name. Because right now if I look in my library, here's Bob, and I can have multiple instances. These are all instances of my Bob symbol. But if I want to tell Flash to control one of these, so I press keyboard arrows to make one of these bobs move around on the screen, it doesn't know which one I mean. So I have to give them a name so that Flash will go, oh, that's the one you're talking about. That's the one you want to move and control. So to do that, I have to click on my object. And in the property panel, you'll see at the top when the object is selected, I have an option for an instance name. It's an instance of the Bob symbol in my case. And your symbol can be named whatever you named yours, but mine is an instance of Bob. So in this case, I can now type in an instance name. Now, that does require us to adhere to a few restrictions on our names. We cannot begin our name with a number. We are not allowed to use any funny special characters. And we're not allowed to use spaces in our instance names. So we're not allowed spaces, funky characters, or anything else. We are only allowed in our instance names to use letters. Oops, not a semicolon. Underscore. And if we begin with a the letter, then I could use a number. My recommendation is we adhere to a naming scheme that is we begin with a lowercase letter and if we want to use multiple words so if I wanted to say this is Bob the first I would say Bob first and the second word I capitalize its letter. So I can see the distinction between them. If I use all lowercase letters when I put multiple words together, it's a little bit harder to read. So I can also just say Bob. Now one thing you will notice is my instance name here, I have done Bob with a lowercase. If I look in my library, you will see the symbol name is Bob and Bob is uppercase. Instance names are case sensitive. Now the name as it appears in my library is my library name, but my library name and instance name are not allowed to be identical. So a convention is we use capitalization to tell them apart. So this is an instance of Bob, and if I had more than one Bob, it could be Bob 1. Now we know Bob 1 is not the same as Bob, but lowercase b bob is not the same as uppercase b bob either. They are not the same thing. If you do use the same instance name as the library name, it will sometimes fail. You will get weird error messages and you will look and you'll go, my instance name is there, my code is all correct, why is it failing? And it's because you've recycled the name improperly. So convention is library objects get uppercases to start. Instance names always begin with the lowercase. 
Letters followed by numbers, no spaces, and no funny characters. And if you follow those guidelines and restrictions, you will have a better chance of success when you are trying to build interactivity with your projects. So I've now provided an instance name for Bob. Bob is selected. If I go into my code snippet, I will see that there is a code snippet for, it's under one of these, under animation, move with keyboard arrows. When I click on a snippet, I can click on the little eye next to it. It tells me a description of what's going to happen, allows the object to be moved with the keyboard arrows. Cool, that's what I want. I can click on the curly brace here, and it shows me exactly what code it's going to add to my project. And at that point, I can hit insert, drops the code into my project. Now, if I look here, it added a new layer. And on this layer, it called it actions. And we have a new icon here that we haven't seen before, where it adds this little A indicating that there is code on this frame. We do not put code onto objects themselves. We put code in the main timeline, and then that code references objects, which is why we have to give them names. We give the object an instance name. Now we can do something to it. That is the general operation. So if I test this project now, I will see it comes up, and there's Bob and his friends. And because I specified this particular object, we can see that he is moving, and the other instances of Bob are not. When you get an error in your coding, which will happen to all of you at some point, it shows up in your compiler errors window down at the bottom of the screen. And when you see those errors, you can double click on an error and it will bring you to that particular line of code where Flash believes it ran into the problem. Most of the time it's pretty close, but sometimes it brings you to a line, even though that's not the problem line, but something else has occurred that's making it think that's the problem line. So it, it, it's better than it used to be where it just gave you random code numbers where it would say error number 2009 and you'd have to go Google online. What's that mean? And then you'd have to try and figure out how to fit that in and you have no idea what line number it may or may not have occurred on. So if I double click, it pulls up the actions panel. When I see the actions panel here, we can see here's the code that we'll be working with in a little bit. And over here, this is some of the library that we have access to. I'm going to recommend when you pull up the action panel that you close that left hand side because we don't need it for what we're doing. I also recommend you make this window a little bit bigger so that you can see more lines of code at a given time. That will make everything a little bit easier. Now if you don't have any error messages, so your error message window is clean, and you're like I need to pull up my code. You can't just go into your timeline and double click, nothing happens. You can go under your window pull down menu and choose actions. You also notice that on the Mac it says option F9 next to your actions palette. If you are in Windows it's just a straight F9 to pull it up, but on Mac it's option F9. So when I select that it pulls up my actions window. And if you want to you can dock this on your display so you can dock it somewhere to make it easier so then it can show and hide depending on how you want to customize your user interface. So this is the code that Adobe just added to my project using the snippets. Now as part of the demonstration I've added it at two separate times to two separate objects so I added it to Bob and to Bob 2 but because we have duplications of a number of things going on, it's causing error messages, which is making it grumpy at the moment. But I, I think we might be able to clean out those lines there. And now when I press the keys, it will work. Because the problem it was running into is it had, it defined the same variable, the same item that we're storing a point of memory in twice 
and in the act of doing so, it caused it to get confused. You can't create the same variable twice. Once you create a variable, you can't create that same named variable. So now we have these objects moving. Both objects, Bob and Bob2, are animating. Looking at the code here that Adobe put in, we'll just analyze the code for Bob. With the code, all of the snippets that Adobe puts in, it gives you comments in it. When we see in the action script, you will see lines that are gray. Those are commented out lines. Those are instructions. I encourage you while you are writing your own code, which you will be doing tonight because we'll be taking the code Adobe wrote and deleting it and starting over and writing our own code because it's better that way. It also helps to reinforce some of the learning that we need to happen. And I also don't like how they've named different things in it. So we could use find and replace and change a bunch of names, but it's easier. We'll just do it ourselves. Right. Now, looking at this, we'll see that there's not a lot of comments that Adobe has put into this particular snippet. Some snippets are going to be filled with tons of comments as part of it. But the comments are in gray. We either use the block comment using the slash and the star ending with the star and a slash. Uh, another way to put in a comment is two slashes and then you can type this is a comment. And now that allows you to put a comment into your code. So you can put comments on their own lines. We can also put a comment next to it and say something like move Bob up. So you can put a comment at the end of a line using two slashes and then move Bob up. So I encourage you when you are first learning how to do this to put comments in all over through your code. Comments don't impair performance. All they do is make the code more readable for you down the line. So the more comments you put in, that means a week from now, two weeks from now, a month from now, you're not staring at the code going, what that line do again? When you put it in, and intentionally put it in, put in comments. It will help you. I do that to my own code when I'm learning new concepts. I put comments at the end of every line saying, this does this, this does that, and try and put in those reminders so that when I look at it later, I'm not stuck trying to figure it out. So with that, we're going to go through and create recreate what this does ourselves using names that I think are a little bit easier to understand and make a little bit more sense as part of it. But essentially the short version of what's going on here is we have three actions taking place. One is specifying to move our character. One is specifying to take care of pressing a key, key press. And one is unkey pressing or releasing a key. So we're taking care of these three different situations and then making certain things that we need to have happen with the computer occur so that we can make our artwork come to life. And that's really what it's all about. So at this point, I'm going to highlight everything Adobe gave me and hit delete because I don't want it. I'm going to make my own. And we're going to start out and just work on making our character, our item, be able to move left and right. But we're going to produce it ourselves because it may have looked like a lot, but then once you see it broken down, you'll realize it's not so bad. Now, working with Flash, it's an event-driven language. It listens for events to occur and it responds to those events. That's really the nature of most of the coding that you will do in Flash is you will be writing listeners to say, hey, listen for this, listen for this mouse movement, listen for this key press, listen for a mouse click, listen for a score to hit a certain amount. So you set all of these listeners of what you want to have happen, what is the event. And then you specify the action that you want to take place. And those actions are written as what's referred to as a function within Flash. Now sometimes we need to keep track of certain things such as which key I have pressed and 
want to know that kind of information and we need to know which key is being pressed and which key then is not being pressed anymore or is being released. So we're going to track those kinds of pieces of data. So what we're first going to do is before we make our creatures or characters, your Bob, start reanimating around on the screen is we're going to capture that keyboard press and release so that we can make sense out of what is going on. Now with that we need to understand that each key on the keyboard has a specific character. So we can see when I type it puts letters on screen because the core operating system on the computer knows when it registers that key press it should display that particular character. So it's written by the person who programmed the operating system and programmed then in this case flash. So we're going to be listening for those keystrokes so that when they occur within your interactive project that something can now occur. So what we need to do is we need to tell our movie to listen for that key to be pressed and listen for that key to be released. So we'll start out with the pressed first. Now there's a Writing an event listener, there's a certain syntax and grammar that we have to follow with it. And it's not the cleanest in terms of it's short, but once you get used to it, it's not so bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask our stage. Now the stage is our movie itself. So when we talk about stage in code, you're referring to the whole of the movie. So it's our main object that's going on. And key presses and key releases are registered with the stage. We don't assign them to an object because we can tell, hey, Bob, you know, why don't you listen for this or why don't you listen for that? We could, but it, with key presses, they're picked up by the stage. They're not picked up by objects. Now, when we press a key, as we saw, we can then tell an object to do something, but the key press itself is not picked up by the object. So we say stage, we tell it to add an event listener, now as part of this you'll go wow that's a lot to type in to remember and what you do is you either use snippets or use previous projects or online tutorials as reference for code until you commit whatever you are willing to commit to memory to memory. And then after that you can decide if you want to remember it or if you just want to type it in. Now sometimes if we've added in some other lines of code here we would actually have code hinting where Flash would then be prompting us with I think you mean this and then you can choose off a list of what it is so you're not stuck just having to pull out of your memory or pull from a previous source. So what I have written here is I have said stage, listen, oh, don't want to drag that word, add event listener, so I'm telling the stage to listen for a keyboard event, and that event is key down. So that's when a key has been pressed, and when that occurs, it's going to call this function. Now that function has not been defined yet because we only have one line of code, and the function is the verb, the action we want to have happen. So we're going to have variables, those are kind of like nouns, and functions are the verbs. And when we pair these different things together, we're able to build sentences, which is really when we construct and create our interactivity as part of our project. <coughs> We've added in the event listener, it is case sensitive. You have to suck it up and just accept that's what the capitalization is. Mm -hmm. If you do a few other things, which requires typing more code to begin with, it will give you better code hinting, such as life. So my recommendation is once you have files, you save those files and use them as reference for future code projects. That's what I do. I am always going back to previous projects and looking up how did I write that, what is the syntax, and a lot of copy pasting between projects. That's normal. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the function that is called here key is pressed. So to define a function, this action that we want to occur, we can just simply say the word function 
and it turns a nice beautiful shade of purple and then we type in the name of our function as we have named it he is pressed and capitalization will matter now if you find that that's too much typing for you sometimes you could shorten it your names of your variables of your functions to just single letters or a couple letters like k KD for key down, KU for key up, and things like that. But I find that, especially in the beginning, using a little more verbosity, longer words in your names, makes things a little bit more readable with the code. I fought that for years and years and tried to make all of my names as short as possible because I was lazy. But I find my code is infinitely more readable and understandable if I use longer names. So I've gotten over that kind of phobia of typing long, short name, or phobia of long names and I'm finding my code is just a lot easier to use. Now when we define a function, functions we use the word function, the name of the function, then we put parentheses after it, but when a function that we're calling is associated with an event, and this is the keyboard event of key down, so when it's associated with that we have to put a little uh, bit of code inside the parentheses, and this is again just part of the required syntax, and if you studied the Adobe code you would see that it did have everything that we're typing here. We're just going to use what I think is a little cleaner naming scheme. So we use E and that's going to give us an ability to reference this event which is something we will need to do in our code and then we do it put a colon and then you specify what kind of event and now you see code hinting appearing and if I use the down arrows I can cycle and up arrow I can cycle through and the event that I specify in these parentheses matches what my event listener was. My event listener said keyboard event, so here I say keyboard event. And if it's highlighted here, then I can hit return on the keyboard and it inserts it. You will notice now it's added a little line up top, import flash events keyboard event. If that line was already present in our code before we started typing, the moment I started typing my event listener here, it would have given me some code hinting to fill in the blank. Same thing over here, it would have helped me out. But you have to decide what, you know, is that more or less work having it do that for you. Now we have a few other things we have to type in as we finish out defining our function. We have to specify if and what this function is returning as a value but this function is returning nothing so we use the word void to indicate it does not return anything. It's possible to have functions return values such as a true or false value, return a computed number, return a string or something like that. We end lines of code with a semicolon that is the period at the end of the sentence. When we have things occurring in a line of code it's always going to have a colon if you see colon versus semicolon and you're in doubt semicolons will be at the end of something otherwise it's always going to be a colon most always they, never want to use always but most always so the white space between lines of text here so if I get rid of the extra returns like that getting rid of the line the white space that makes my code more compact, but it makes it harder to read. But Flash accepts extra line space, so you can put an extra line space if you want while you're working, that's fine, that doesn't have any bearing on performance. If you put everything all into one line and after the semicolons, it theoretically will work, but you could run into some weird issues along the way, so I would discourage you from doing that. I would encourage you to put an extra line spaces because it will make it more readable down the road. So now, in this function, I want to know what key has been pressed. Now, we can do this by sending a message to ourselves, and Flash has a feature that will send out a message to the output window. And we can specify the word trace, you pressed the and then we're going to put a plus to say then add to this and then I will say e dot key code and you can see code hinting was helping me out there semicolon instead of a line 
So what this will do is this will send me a message. Now if you work in JavaScript, you would use console.log. If you work in Python or processing, you would use print line, Java print line. So we use different commands that will send these messages to us that give us information. So if I take my project here, it's a good idea while you're working to save regularly. You never know when Flash will go belly up. And if I run and press a key on the keyboard, you will see now in my output window it says you press the and it says 76, 71, 70. Now if I want to know the key code, the number that the computer associates with say the left arrow key is 37. The right arrow key is 39. Up arrow key is 38, down arrow key is 40. So working clockwise, starting with the left arrow key, it's 37, 38, 39, and 40 to give me my four arrow keys. If I wanted to build a game that utilized the keys W, A, S, D, which are common keyboard controls for keyboard or browser-based games, the A key is 65, the W key is 87, the D key is 68, and the S key is 83. So if I wanted to know the number the key computer is generating when I press a specific key, that is the key code. So I can now trace this message out because periodically if you go a long stretch without accessing the key codes on the computer, you may not remember what they are, but you want to use them in your project. So you can just send yourself a simple trace message to go, oh, that's what the keys are, without having to say do a Google search or something like that. Empower yourself. Don't always rely on Google. To make Bob move around the screen, and if you named your uh, object something other than Bob at some point, then we will, you might need to modify your code accordingly. So my character on the stage that I I'm going to animate is Bob. So with that, when I press this key, a real easy thing I could do is when I press the key, I could just simply say Bob, and I want to modify your X position, and I'm going to move you over. So does anyone know what position Bob is on screen right now? What his X position might be? I have no idea. Do we actually need to know? What do you think? Do you think we need to know where he is? Where he is? Yeah. Do we need to know his X and Y coordinates yet? No, I don't think so. Yeah, we really don't. Because Bob is here. Here's Bob. And he does have a position. He's at 248 and 166.75. So that's where he's at. Now I just moved him again. But I don't really care where he's at. All I want to do is just add a certain value to his position. So I don't have to know what he's currently at. And now keep in mind that the coordinate system 0, 0 is top left and then 550 by 400 is bottom right. So X is getting bigger moves to the right, X is, or Y is getting bigger moves down. So 0, 0 is here and then numbers get bigger as we go right and down. That's important to keep in mind as we build interactivity. So when I go into the code, I can say, Bob, I want to set your x equal to whatever your current x is, and I'm going to add 5 to that. So I'm going to add 5 to where you are. Now, you will notice that I put some extra spaces in here as part of my workflow. So I'm adding in some spaces to make it more readable to you. If you don't put these extra spaces in, the white space, it will work just fine, but I find that when I'm trying to do code for other people to read, I put the spaces in. When I'm doing code for myself, I don't put the spaces in because that's extra typing. So you don't need these spaces. You could have it very tight. And that will work just fine. But I'm going to try and put the spaces in tonight because I believe it makes it a little bit more readable to look at. So Bob, I'm going to set your x equal to whatever your current x is and add five more to that. So when I press a key right now, Bob is going to move. I'm not tracking which key, I'm just doing it. 
one thing that you will want to do when you are coding is you will want to do it, get something working, then add in more complexity. Because right now I could check and go, hey, well, did I press this key or that key? And then I want, well, first, why don't I verify I can make a move? Once I know I can make a move, then I can start assigning that movement to a specific key. So baby steps, tiny little things one at a time versus here's all the stuff I want to do and I try and put it all in and it totally breaks and I have no idea where it's broken. You can take that approach, but most people don't have good luck with it. So now if I press a key on the keyboard, it doesn't matter which key, we can see that Bob is moving over. And if I keep pressing, there we go. And it's registering off of the press of the key. All right. So Bob moved. But I think I would rather tie Bob's movement. So if he's going to move to the right, I want to press the right arrow key. So to move him to the right, what we need to do is say if, and I'm going to write it out in plain language first, then put it into proper code speak. So if the key pressed is right arrow, then let's move Bob over. So that's the plain language version of what we're going to try and do. So if the key pressed is right arrow, then move box Bob to the right. I'll just finish the whole sentence and comment that out. Move Bob to the right five pixels. That's what that line says. Now I can leave that in there as a comment and I can comment a line of code out. Let's see, no, wrong program, can't use that shortcut. Two slashes that comments that line out. Now we can say if the key code is equal to, if it compares equal to this, see this is important because you'll notice I did two equal signs and the right arrow key wa had a key code of 39. So if the key code turned it out to be 39, then I want to move Bob over and I'll just move Bob over like that. So if the key I pressed, its code is equal to. If we say is equal to, we have to use two equal signs. And then if we are setting something equal to something, we use a single equal sign. That's a very important concept to keep in mind. If you use a single equal sign here, you will get an error message because that says if, and then you set something and it goes, huh? I don't get what you mean. And it will give a give me some type of error message. So we'll see. Uh, assignment within conditional. Did you mean double equal sign instead of single equal sign? Look at it's even giving us a useful error message. It's not just failing miserably and silently. So if you've worked in some other languages where it does do that, it's kind of refreshing to see says, did you mean double equal sign? It's like, oh yeah. What now, is, if I double click, it even will bring me up here. What again is it? Running this movie. Now, if I hit left arrow, nothing. Up, down, no. Hit the right arrow. Now we can see that Bob is moving. And now I'm going to do it again. And if I press the key once, he moves. If I press the key once and hold down, you'll notice that there's a little pause before he keeps moving. And that pause there is actually tied to my keyboard repeat rate. So if I say a long repeat rate and say key repeat slow, now if we test my movie, if I press the key quickly, it moves. If I press and hold down, Long wait, and now we can see chug, 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 chug. So that 
type of interactivity where we have constrained the movement to the repeat rate set in the system preferences means we don't have a lot of control over the movement or interactivity of our object because it's tied to whatever the user settings are on their keyboard. So if someone has set their key repeat rate to be really slow because they are a heavy fingered typer so they rest their fingers on keys a lot and don't and want to think about where their next key is going to be then they're going to see some pretty poor performance out of your project. But there is a better way to do it and that better way is going to be very similar to what was in the snippet and that's what we're going to look at now. To get this to move smoother we have to do a couple of other things. So what we can do instead of setting Bob's repeat here we're going to handle that information somewhere else. So we're going to have to create another event listener and the event listener we're going to create is going to be enter frame. So we're going to use this event enter frame listener. Now the code hinting is coming up and it's helping me out here. And I'm going to refer to this as my main draw. And I could call it my main draw loop, my main draw function. Now what happens here is we have a one frame movie. This movie is now entering this frame 24 times per second. That's what our enter frame is event is happening. Every frame, based on the frame rate, it registers enter frame. So effectively what that does is that creates a loop that we can use to update objects. So now if I have function main draw and it needs, because it's tied to an event, needs to say e colon event. This time it says event because it's tied to the enter frame event. Previously we had key is pressed tied to a keyboard event. And this function again doesn't return anything. Hit a curly brace, hit return, and it puts in the closing curly brace for us. Very handy feature because it's very annoying that when you put an opening curly brace and forget your closing curly brace and don't match things then it fails and then it gets grumpy, error messages, you rip your hair out, cry in the corner, it's not pretty. So our main draw loop, even just pulling, uh, I'm just going to pull my uh, X update line from that. So if I run this what we're going to see is 24 times per second Bob is going to move five pixels. Well, that would probably be a little bit too fast. I'm going to just slow it down to one, and we're still going to see some pretty decent movement out of Bob here. He's going to get kind of busy. So if you watch when I test my movie, you can see there he is. So he's moving 24 pixels per frame. If we go back to our original five, let's see, he starts hauling. There goes Bob. He's moving. So Bob is now updating his position every frame. But we don't want Bob to update every frame. We only want Bob to start moving when I press the key down. So when I press the key, that's when I want Bob to start going. So to pull that off, we get to use our conditional again. And I'll put it in plain language first and say if right arrow. I'll just say if right is being pressed then move Bob. There you go. So in code speak if right is true so if right is being pressed then we want Bob to move. So you may be thinking, it's like, wait, he just typed in the word right as if it just exists. 
And wouldn't it be nice if we just had a property of right that we could say, yeah, when right is true, I want that to go. And what we could even say is, when we press that key, I want to set right equal to true. So when I press my right arrow, I want right to be true. So if we just make that statement and run our project right now, we're going to get a big flaming error message and it will scold us. Because we're using something that hasn't been defined yet. So if I run this, we'll see it scolded me. It says, access of undefined property right. So it's going, yeah, you're asking for this right thing, but you never told me what it is. But that's an easy thing to remedy. We can define it. We can just simply say, sorry, forgot a capital letter there. So I can start out, and I'm going to create what is referred to as, oh, sorry, wrong language here. Uh, There we go. Create a variable. I'll name it right. That then put a colon. Then I specify what kind of variable it is. Now within programming languages, we have static and di dynamically typed languages. Static typed languages mean when we have a variable, we have to specify what kind of object that is. Now think of a variable as a container. It contains something. A variable is where we tell the computer, set aside a piece of your memory and don't forget this thing. And we have to say what kind of memory to set aside. So we say var for variable, the name we want. Notice everything that we're creating shows up in black. Var right, and it's a Boolean, meaning it has two values, true and false. There are different kinds of variables we have access to. We have numbers and integers and strings and characters and booleans and <laughs> movie clips and sprites and just all kinds of really fun-filled objects. This variable is a boolean. It has two values. It's either true or it's false, which works really well in computer languages because computers operate on ones and zeros, trues and false, on or off. So it's really kind of nice to, if you write your logic to either be something true or something false, it works pretty well. So var right colon boolean equals false. So we start out, right isn't true, I'm not pressing the key. So when I start my project here, I'm not pressing the key, Bob is parked, he's not moving. If I hit the right arrow key, I'll we'll see Bob starts going. But if you notice, I press the key once, and he kept going and kept going. So I press key down, sets right equal to true, Bob takes off. Boom, there goes Bob, he's gone. He's gonna go until the cows come home. So I have no way to make right become false and stop Bob from moving. To make right become false, I'm going to effectively just duplicate a lot of the code that I already have here. One thing you'll find when you are coding, a lot of it, it looks scary when you read the code and then you realize it's highly repetitive. Computers don't care about doing the same thing over and over and over. People do. So there are more optimized ways you can do things that cut down on some of the repetition, but in the beginning, don't run from it. Don't be scared of it. Don't be intimidated by it. Just accept it and it's okay. So I'm going to copy that Put a copy of it and now we have key is pressed so I think an appropriate name would be key is released so key is pressed key is released instead of being a key down event it's going to be a key up event so I deleted key down in the period retyped the period and now code hinting is even helping me out it goes oh I bet you want that and it's like yes of course I do you're awesome flash thank you and now I can duplicate my key is pressed function and have a key is released function. Now one thing to remember, currently now I have key is pressed appearing twice here. If I run this, I will get an error message and it will say duplicate function definition. 
that's because I tried to define key is pressed twice. Now, that may seem like, wow, Flash, you're being picky. But the thing to keep in mind is it makes perfect sense. Why should I be allowed to describe the, or define the same thing more than once? So I had key is pressed. Now I will have key is released. And if the key released, and releasing a key generates the same key code kind of message. So I can say re released. You press a key, you release the key. And if I want to further extend that out, I could put a plus here and say key, just so it sounds a little bit more grammatically correct. And when I release the key, I want write to become false. So if I press a key, and that key's code happens to be 39, write becomes true. If I release a key, and that key's code happens to be 39, right becomes false. So it was highly repetitive, but now if I press release, we can see my two output messages and Bob stopped moving. It's pretty slick. So currently, we have Bob moving to the right. To move Bob to the left, means we're going to need a few more things that are just going to be repeats of what's already there. So we can repeat our boolean and now have a right and we could have a left one. Now inside our main draw function, paste that to now change this to left. So when left is true, I want to set Bob's x is equal to, and now moving left is about subtracting an a value versus adding a value. Moving to the right adds a value. Moving to the left subtracts a value. And now I just go into my key pressed and key release functions and just do a little copy pasting. I'm just going to put some extra returns at the bottom so I can have my code higher on the screen to make it easier to read. So the right arrow key has a key code of 39. Up arrow is 38. Left arrow is 37. So I can just now change that to a 37, but not 337. And that would be left is equal to true. And then I have to remember to do my key release. Now one thing you will find when you're copy pasting highly similar lines of code like this, it's really easy to get typos so that you don't change all the pertinent details and then your code behaves with weird results. That's normal. You just have to work on fixing it. If you haven't saved recently, I encourage you to do so. And now if I run this, I can move to the left and to the right. And my movement is not based on my key repeat rate. And we can see it's based on these numbers that I have here of plus 5 and minus 5. If I want him to go faster, I can change that value. Change it to 10, and we'll see that he really starts hauling, working his way across. So right now, Bob moves. Moving him off the other keys just means plugging in code that looks for the appropriate key code. Tracing my numbers down there. But right now, Bob looks like he drank too much coffee, so we're going to slow him down a little bit. And I will simply say, Bob, stop. Now if I run my movie, we will see that Bob is stopped. So he's no longer animating and moving. But if I want when Bob is strolling down the street, Bob.play. So we can tell Bob to play when he's moving. So he's parked, and then I move, and now he's moving. But if you notice, we never then retold Bob to stop. So we need to put that into one place that we could do it. And at future times, we're going to put this 
it will be tied into our draw loop, which will probably be broken into a separate function so it's easier to take control of. But instead of getting more complex with that right now, we can just simply say Bob. And if play made him go, we already know that since we did at the beginning, we can tell Bob, hey, Bob, why don't you stop? So now if I run my movie, Bob moves and then stops, which creates a nice visual, unlike Bob's friends, which were floating in the air and animating. But they can't stop moving because they drink so much coffee and Red Bull that they got wings, and now they're floating up in the air. It's always fun to make a story up to go along with your project.